Now, this is the scene of, of, of the last stand of, of the, the troops here on the bridge. This is the last place where we were in, engaged in fighting. Uh, after our uh, attack with, uh, with Lieutenant McDermott onto the house, just on this corner, they're all modern buildings now, of course, but we, we'd taken that in a hand-to-hand -hand fight, which I described in my, my story, we'll say. After we came out of there, there were so few of us that we came back under this bridge. Now, under here was all building materials, cobblestones, flagstones, heaps of gravel, and there was about 25 of our troops congregated just here. Uh, the leader of the band was Captain Franks at the time, and he realised we got very little ammunition, no, no mortar bombs, no, no peat bombs, nothing. Rifles and, and a couple of brand guns. And he took uh, 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 inventory of what we got, realised we got six, uh, six brand guns. He asked for volunteers. He was going to make a breakout, which he did. And uh, he threw my last gammon bomb at a German tank over there. There were three of them. He hit the middle one and knocked it out. And uh, that was the last of our gammon bombs. And uh, Franks took six men from here, accumulated in that corner, were six men with brain guns, and they charged off in that direction. And at the time, we didn't know anything of that. That left Greyburn, Lieutenant Greyburn, in charge, and we were being whittled down by German machine gun fire. And also, immediately there, 30, 40 yards where we parked our car, in fact, there was a, a, a tiger. A German tiger tank, and he was firing, up, not at us, he was firing at these concrete beams under here and dropping these concrete, huge lumps of concrete down on us. Little by little, we were being whittled down, whittled down, until there was only two of us left unwounded, which was Lieutenant Graeber and myself. Most men were badly wounded, couldn't take part, there was no ammunition left. And uh, Lieutenant Graber tapped me on the shoulder just here somewhere behind a heap of gravel and he, he said, it's time to go, lad. And, and he and I dashed across the road. There was a row of houses, or several houses there. And uh, we, as we went across the road, this tiger tank fired and caught Lieutenant Graber and, and he fell in the road just here at the back of those cars there. And I managed to get into the rubble of the houses there. And uh, I realised that uh, Lieutenant Greyburn wasn't dead. He, he moved. I crawled out to him, broad daylight, and there was German troops coming in under these, under this bridge here and under there. And uh, none of them fired at me, which was, to me was amazing. But I crawled out and spoke to him, and he told me to leave him. He knew he was dying, which this is what happened. I went back into the rubble of the houses and crept away to a house which was right on the, on the end of the road there and crept into the cellar and lo and behold there was four of troops, four soldiers that I knew. Sergeant Joy who'd been fired at on the, uh, up by the railway bridge at that time. A Corporal Orris who I didn't know very well, he was new to the platoon. There was Private Robertson, he was our storekeeper in our platoon. And there was this young man from the Remy who'd been with me on a, a number of occasions in, in the different actions we'd been in. He, he, he always seemed to be behind me and, uh, and myself, and that made five of us. And, we, and we, we led in this cellar. We thought, well, we'll wait till it's all the firing had stopped. Even 2nd Battalion headquarters here side the road, that had been overrun. There was one or two shots being fired. What exactly that was, I don't know. And uh, we waited in this cellar until it got dark to creep out. And while we were there, it was all quiet. And I remember somebody from what had been 2nd Battalion headquarters, the, uh, someone there shouted out our battle cry, Waho Muhammad, and it echoed all through these buildings. And at that time, we heard German troops on top of the rubble of the building, we being in the cellar, they shouted out, come out Englanders, we will fight you. 
but uh, the Englanders had got nothing to fight with. We couldn't get out. I'd fired my last shot at this towards this tire tank on this corner. Because Lieutenant Graeber and I went across the road. Lieutenant Graeber, of course, was not dead when I last saw him. Where he actually died, I don't know. But he was a very brave man. He was wounded four times that I know of. His shrapnel in his shoulder, his arm in a sling. He was under here firing his pistol with his left hand. And he was a right-handed man anyway. But uh, he, his leg was bandaged. A very brave man. And he, I was proud to find out after the war that he'd been given the Victoria Cross. Marvellous man. What did they shout out to him, Steve? They shouted out to him, didn't they? Yes, oh yes, there was a, one of the, uh, while Lieutenant Graver was on the ground, some a cultured voice, an officer's voice, who it was, I don't know, in, in, in the ruins of the building there, and shouted out to him, um, um, how bad is it? And, and he shouted back to them, leave me, leave me. But it was after that that I actually went out and tried to get him in, but he said the same thing to me, leave me. He was a heavy man and I couldn't move him myself, so unfortunately I did leave him. And they shouted out, was it farewell? Yes, they, they, they did that. Uh, as, as, as he said that it was no good, he knew he was dying. And, and one of the, this officer voice that shouted out, well, good, the actual words, and it always stuck in my mind, was goodbye, dear boy. That's what was shouted at Graeber as he died. <laughs> On this Monday morning when uh, we were, we were cock a hoop, the Germans had come across here, we knocked out a couple of their armoured vehicles, but one of the, 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 the movements here, which I admired very much, was, was just behind us here, it, 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 there's some steps that come up there, up from the, the lower floor. Now, there, five glider pilots, who had nothing to do with their battalion, they'd flown gliders in, they came here and they got a six pounder anti-tank gun with them. And when you see the steps that they actually lugged this gun up, it makes you wonder how they got here. But they were as close as that to the action. The gun was just there, and the, the German armoured vehicles were starting here and all the way back to the bridge, all knocked out. That was a, a, a very brave move, I thought, of those men. Now, after we'd taken the last day of the battle, after we had taken McDermott's house, which is there between us and that new building over there. We were had to defend it against a, a German counterattack. The Germans always did that. You take a place, and they were immediately back in among you. And uh, I was looking out the top window, and way up alongside the ramp, up the street, the the. Uh, uh, Van Stirum School was just on the left there, it's completely gone now. Now, I could see a, a German machine gunner obviously re uh, putting up a, a machine gun on a tripod. And as our house was the only one that side of the bridge with British troops in it, we knew we were the target. And I thought, well, I don't fancy being fired at here by him. So, I, I watched him and he, while he was putting his machine gun up together, I don't know he might have been drunk, I don't know. But certainly, every time he bent down, he'd soft cap, he hadn't got a helmet on, he got a soft cap. His hat fell off. And I, I was mesmerised looking at him. Every time he'd go pick up his hat, put it back on and carry on with it. But I thought something strange about this. I thought, well, I don't want him firing at me, so I, I borrowed a brain gun from the man in the next window. I set the sights for 600 yards, which I estimated. I gave him half a magazine, and that was the end of him, I'm afraid. He was led there the next day after he was taken prisoner, marked fast, and he was still led there. That was a one, well, I, I was going to say amusing, but a man's death is not amusing, but at the time I did laugh about it. Now this is the scene where uh, on the first Monday morning that that battle took place on the bridge, 
uh, Victor Grabner's reconnaissance unit from the 9th Para, uh, or the 9th SS Division came over the bridge and we heard them rumbling and they came down here. We managed to knock out the first vehicle with, with a whole pin slam by it on the road here, which meant that the others behind were piled up behind. Now, I was in a house where these modern buildings are at the time, but we had an anti-tank gun away down there in the front garden of a house, manned by the Royal Artillery, and because they couldn't depress their gun low enough to get at these armoured vehicles, what they did was put in solid shot in their, in their six-pounder, and they blew this wall out from that distance, with a big gap in the wall right over the top of this underpass here, and they were able then to fire through that shot, through that uh, big gap, and, and actually collide with the with the German vehicles on here, and that particular gun was was accredited with being the gun that knocked out most German vehicles on, on this particular area, and then that battle went on for about an hour, and and then it died down, and we were absolutely swamped with. German mortar fire from all sides and we all led down kept quiet because we couldn't we couldn't even get to the windows to fire out it was really really um, a terrific fire uh, on the last day of them what happened to be my battle here I'd been out ordered to go from a building here to go with uh, Lieutenant McDermott of uh, what was he, number three platoon, A company. He'd lost a lot of men and they wanted us to take a house immediately the other side of the bridge there. And uh, they, we gathered under the bridge there, about 15 or so of us I suppose. McDermott lead in and we charged at this house full of Germans. And I went in the back door immediately behind Lieutenant McDermott, he led the way, his Batman and then me. But going up the stairs, uh, some uh, German with a schmeiser, I assume, an automatic weapon anyway, fired down the stairs, caught McDermott right across the chest, knocked him down, caught his Batman across the stomach with the machine gun. He went down, that left me to get up these stairs on my own, and I, I was fortunate because uh, a, a friend of mine, Lieutenant, um, I beg your pardon, Lance Corporal uh, Dodds, was right behind me. He was in my platoon. And uh, he fired up across the stairs and knocked out this German who was actually fired at us with, for which I was very thankful being the first one up the stairs. Uh, Steve might have been dressed a little bit more dirty than this, but the concluding part of the story. So uh, this is the, really the scene of my last action during the Battle of Arnhem. We'd uh, been knocked out of our positions down by the bridge, and we sheltered, uh, four or five of us had sheltered in a, uh, a cellar there, Sergeant Joy, Corporal Oris, Private Robertson, the young man from the Remy, who I, we'd all met up in this cellar, and, and me, just the five of us. We waited till it was dark and uh, crept out of the cellar. There was no firing going on, the battle was over, we'd lost. And uh, being the bridge being down there, we we crawled on our hands and knees for a matter of this here is a mile, I would say. There's being the Saffron, which local people would know of course, and we crept up all the way on our hands and knees, all the way through bushes and very much as it is here now. We got to approximately this area and we could hear water running, this being private houses along here then, not big buildings like this, and we could hear water running. We'd been without water for a couple of days there and believe me our tongues were hardly hanging out, they were filling their mouths, they weren't hanging out. And uh, we could hear this water running. It was getting light and we were getting a bit dubious because there was German armoured cars 
stationed up there with sentries on and uh, you could see them, they were just getting light. But Sergeant Joey said, well there's water running over there lads, I can hear it, let's go. So we got up one by one and crossed this road somewhere here where there was a derelict house that had been bomb damaged and we went into this house but of course these German sentries on these armoured cars further up there had seen us. They came down here and they positioned a couple of machine guns here pointing towards the cellar that we were in. We'd seen them come in and uh, they came across and Englanders come out and of course the Englanders, no weapons, a fighting knife. We had to come out and that was the end of the Battle of Arnhem as far as I was concerned.